All right, praise the Lord, because there is none like Him. 1 Samuel, chapter number 15, if you would. 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. Somebody needs you. Did you all know that? Somebody in this world needs you, whether you realize it or not. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people in this world that need you. 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. We're going to read the last verse of chapter 15 and the first verse of chapter 16. Just to remind you as, as, um, as you're finding it there, 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 16 is the story of David being anointed as the king. And uh, so this has to do with Saul, Samuel, and David. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. Now Saul was not yet dead, but uh, he mourned for Saul and the relationship. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Father we thank you for your word today. We pray your blessings upon it as we look into it. Lord, we pray that uh, the message today will be understandable and clear. And, uh, Lord, that when we leave here in a few moments, we'll say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. (coughs) If there's someone that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, may they realize that He's their only hope. He's the only way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been disappointed in life? You ever been disappointed? Oh, yeah, we all have. How are we disappointed in this world? Well, we're disappointed mainly with people, with people, with relationships. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it could be family, or it could be co-workers, it could be church people, it could be the general public. Uh, we're disappointed. We're disappointed in our circumstances. Sometimes where our circumstances are just uh, very disappointing. Our personal problems. We have personal uh, situations that are going on that uh, we're disappointed in. Uh, Again, it may be something to do with work or it may be something to do with finances or it could even be uh, something to do with politics and, and, and things going on. You're disappointed. But mainly we're just going to be disappointed with people. People disappoint. Someone said, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. (laughs) The only bad thing about the ministry is it is about the people. And that's what it is, 100%. The people. Have you ever said this? Boy, I sure wish my job would be like it used to be. I sure wish our church could be like it used to be. I wish our nation could be like it used to be. I wish our world would just get back to normal like before COVID. I wish my friends could be like they used to be. I wish my health could be like it used to be. I wish my finances could be like it used to be. I wish my family could be like it used to be. And we could, et cetera, et cetera. In this passage, and by the way, I I just believe the Word of God has all the answers for every question of life. In these stories we read sometimes. And um, I'm going to answer a question today that maybe you've had on your mind. I don't know. And maybe this is for one person here today. Maybe it's for everybody. I don't know. But I will say this. it's It's kind of a weird message. 
But in this passage, we have Samuel mourning for Saul. And whether you realize it or not, it doesn't tell us in the Bible here, but between uh, 1535 and 161 is about four years. Is about four years. And so when we end chapter 15, Samuel uh, was no longer going to see Saul, and he was mourning for Saul. And then in chapter 16, we have the Lord appearing to Samuel and saying, How long are you going to mourn? Four years later. Samuel had been stuck in the past for four years, waiting to return to normal for the last four years. 1,460 days of mourning, grieving over Saul and the relationship that he had had with him. You see, you remember the story how that the people of Israel had rejected God as their king. And they wanted what everybody else had a king. We want a king. And so God uh, allowed them to have a king that would sit on a tangible throne. And he appointed, he, he appointed Samuel to anoint Saul. And so Saul was the new king. And Saul and Samuel began a very uh, important friendship uh, over the next few years. Uh, uh, Samuel had anointed Saul as the king. And a, and a great friendship had developed and, and, and this, this uh, relationship that they had had would be hard for either one of them to walk away from. It was not a casual friendship. Matter of fact, it was very spiritual, very significant. And it impacted the lives of a nation. Samuel and Saul's relationship. A coupling of a prophet and a king had been bound together in God's story. And, and no one ever wants to sever something that's this divine. But yet Saul rebelled against the Lord. He spared the best of the Amalekites' cattle for an offering, even though the Lord had commanded him to destroy everything and every person. Saul's version of sacrifice became more important to him than God's definition of obedience. To obey is always better than sacrifice. And so what God did is He rejected Saul as the king of Israel. And He said, I am going to get somebody new. I'm going to get somebody new. And the Bible says Samuel mourned. Samuel mourned. Have you ever grieved over a relationship that is dead with no hope of resurrection? Have you ever been depressed over a missed opportunity? Have you ever mourned over an unrealized expectation? Have you ever cried over a moral or ethical failure? And then God comes along beside you one day and says, How long are you going to mourn? How long are you going to mourn? In this passage, these two verses, we see God instructing Samuel to move on from King Saul. You see, God had moved on. God had moved on. And he was telling Samuel, it's time for you to move on. Stop crying over Saul. Stop mourning over Saul. Even though Samuel was no longer tied up with Saul in person, his emotions were. His thoughts and his energies were still uh, mired in grief, binding him to a dream now done. It was time for something new, a new thing. It's time, Samuel, for you to get a horn, get some oil, and get on with life. New relationships and new opportunities lay ahead for you. No sense in spreading the present morning for the past. Because God said, I'm done with him. I've moved on. It's time for you to move on. Well, as you think about this, you and I have been in situations just like this in our life. Whether or not you realize it, there are some people, there are some circumstances, there are some situations that we must learn to get over. We have to get over. Sometimes it's best to get over. 
Regardless of how much we love and care or yearn for someone or something, God declares that there is a day that we must stop crying and grieving and mourning. It's time to get over it. It's time to move on. For Samuel, he, God had a new king for him to anoint. And he couldn't do this while he was lamenting the old one. A shepherd boy. A shepherd boy was unwittingly waiting in the fields for Samuel to relinquish what had been so he could be a part of what was to be. King David was part of Samuel's future, but he would have never gotten there had he not got over Saul. What new thing is the Lord asking of you this morning? Is there anything old or even cold that you're still giving your thoughts and emotions and energies to? Do you need to let something go of the past so that you can embrace the present? The Lord says, How long are you going to mourn? How long are you going to grieve? How long are you going to give all your energy to it? It's time to move on. Three thoughts here this morning. Number one, mourning will not change anything. Now, you know I'm not against mourning and grieving. Of course, we we all mourn and grieve over situations in our life. But there comes a point to when it's it's got to stop. There comes a point to where it paralyzes us uh, from moving on. And, you know, initially Saul seemed like the answer, but Saul became very arrogant and very prideful and very full of himself. And God said, I'm done with Saul, Samuel. Why aren't you? I'm done with him. Why aren't you? Now, none of us can change anything that's ever happened in our life. We cannot change anything. And we can sit around and mourn and grieve all day long, and it's not going to change anything. And if we just sit around and mourn and grieve all the time, we are going to paralyze ourselves. And God says you cannot live in the past. I know a lady one time, her testimony to me was that she had lost her husband and thought the end of the world had happened. And uh, she sat in her living room basically for two years and hardly got out of it. And one day she woke up and she said, this is the craziest thing I could be doing. And then she ended up getting back in life and ended up having a wonderful life. Now that's for the uh, that's talking about someone who has died, but I'm I'm talking about people who are alive. (laughs) Saul was alive, and Samuel was told by God. He said, "Get over it, get over it." Let me remind you this morning that bad things happen in this life. Not everything that happens to you is going to be good. There's going to be bad things that happen. Matter of fact, do you all know what Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says? You don't have to turn there because you'll know it when I get ready to tell tell it to you. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And here's what some of the times are. I I just love these verses. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. Well, being born is a good thing. Dying, well, in the Lord is a good thing, but you know what, physically speaking, dying is not a good thing. So there's going to be bad things going to happen. Going to be good things, going to be bad things. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which was planted. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to break down. There's a time to build up. There's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn, but then there's a time to dance. There's a time to cast away stones, and there's a time to gather stones together. There's a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to get, a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Bad things are going to happen. 
And listen, bad things happen on a regular basis for that matter. Are we just going to sit around and mourn and grieve over all that? Are we going we gonna, to uh, not let it paralyze us and we're going to move on? Because God's got some good stuff out there. And I believe it. So first of all, mourning won't change anything. It'll keep us paralyzed. Secondly, mourning too long will hinder our usefulness to God. Mourning too long will hinder our usefulness to God. Now I want to remind you here this morning that God was done with Saul, but not with Samuel. God was done with Saul, but he was not done with Samuel. And by continuing, the Bible says, Samuel mourned for Saul four years. He mourned for Saul. And he grieved for Saul. A severed relationship. He, had, he didn't see him. Didn't talk to him. A severed relationship. He mourned for four years and then God comes to him one day and says, How long are you going to mourn? I'm done with him. Time for you to be done with him. And, and Samuel, you're growing derelict in your responsibilities as priest, judge, and prophet. Now here is God's prophet, his priest, the spiritual leader among the people, the proclaimer of the good news, the priest anointed to do the Lord's work. And as he continued to mourn over Saul, he is abdicating his spiritual assignment. God had rejected Saul from being king. This action was final, irreversible. There wasn't nothing Saul could do to get it back. There wasn't nothing Samuel could do to get it back for Saul. Nothing. But Samuel had difficulty in accepting it. And he had been so closely associated with Saul. And, and now he mourned and he wept to see his hopes, uh, you know, disappointed. He was disappointed. And he continued to mourn a loss that could never be retrieved. And so God comes to him and he says, quit your crying. Quit your mourning. Go and anoint Saul's successor. And God's basically telling him, my program has not failed. I have a better man than Saul to step onto the stage of Israel's history. So you see, God came to Samuel and he said, I have a job for you to do, but you cannot do it as long as you're mourning over, over Saul. I've got a job for you to do. It's time to anoint a new king. And it was David this time, not Saul. Saul, uh, God's telling Samuel in so many words here that Saul ended up being very hurtful and very bad for you. And we all have very hurtful and bad experiences in life. You know, there's some people who used to encourage you that now discourage the fire out of you. We've got to move on. God can still use you. There's a job for you to do. There comes a time when we must stop mourning. There comes a time when we have to get over the, with the, over the past and get on with the present. We should not sit around and moan and groan and gripe and complain and, 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 and have a pity party. That's not what God wants. Persistent grieving and mourning will change your nature, but not your situation. It will change you. You see, Samuel used to be this uh, bold, strong leader in Israel. He was strong. He was authoritative at one time. But now he's grieving over, over Saul, something that is irreversible and irretrievable. And God says, I want you to go back to being that person you were. Go back to be that strong leader. I, I, I've, I've got a job for you to do. You're hindering my program at the moment. Saul is spiritually impotent. So it's time to move on. The longer Samuel grieved, the longer he put God's program on hold. God had moved on. God had moved on. You know, sometimes a ministry may be taken away from us and given to somebody else, and we grieve over the death of an avenue of service. 
Sometimes it's a friendship or a partnership that's been severed and life seems empty and flat. Or we may have been, again, cruelly disappointed by someone that's very dear to us and we mourn the death of a valued relationship. Or maybe some dream that we've had is shattered, some ambition is frustrated, and we mourn the death of a noble aspiration or vision. And again, there's nothing wrong with mourning, but it should not be prolonged to the extent that it cripples our effectiveness in meeting the challenges of the hour and of the day. Instead of a mourning heart, you know what we need? You know what we need? Instead of a mourning heart, you know what we need? We need a merry heart. We need a merry heart. That's what God wants us to have. Even in the midst of of all sorts of bad things going on in our life, even then God wants us to have a merry heart, folks. You see, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. But a broken spirit, a grieving mourning spirit drieth up the bones. But a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 15 tells us, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. And all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Listen, things are not always the way we want them to be. And as I said earlier, we could go say, Oh, I wish this was like it used to be. I wish that was like it used to be. But then you know what we really need to say? It is well with my soul. Amen. And we've got to have a merry heart and a merry countenance. I love that the merry heart hath a continual feast in life. You see, sorrow will be done away with one day. And joy, let me tell you, will come in the morning. And it's your choice. It's your choice. Samuel mourned over Saul. God said, I'm done with him, Samuel. I'm done with the situation, done with the relationship. Listen, it's time for you to move on. Quit your mourning. Quit your crying. Quit your belly aching. It's time to move on. Got something for you to do. And then I say thirdly to you this morning. Somebody needs you. Somebody needs you. David needed Samuel. Saul and Samuel no longer had a relationship. God was not done with Samuel. And David needed Samuel's ministry. Saul had failed, but David had not. And I'd like to thank this morning for every Saul there is a David. There is somebody out there that needs us. Somebody out there that needs our ministry. We may not be able to, we cannot minister to everybody. We can't make there's many, many people we may have used to minister to that we can no longer minister to. But there's somebody out there that needs us. And somebody out there needs us to minister to them. So we do not punish those who are with us for those who are no longer in our lives. We do not punish those who are with us for those who are no longer in our lives. God was through with Saul, but he wasn't through with Samuel. And somebody else needed Samuel. What did he tell him in verse 1? He said, I've rejected Saul, but then he says, Fill thine horn with oil and go, I will send thee to Jesse to Bethlehem, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Somebody needs you. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians, if you would. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number 1. Philippians 1, verse number 20. According to my earnest expectation 
and my hope. That in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. And continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Paul says this in so many words. He said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. To die is gain. To die is, I'm ready to go. But then he says this. But I really want to kind of hang around because there's somebody or a bunch of somebodies who needs me. Who needs me. Somebody needs my ministry. Somebody needs my love. Somebody needs my attention. Somebody needs my writings. Whatever it is. And this morning, I tell you, somebody needs you. Somebody needs you. Who is it? Who are they? I don't know. But you do. You do. You may not even know who it all is. And I think one fascinating thought from, again, 1 Samuel is this, that Samuel had never even heard of David up until the time he anointed him as king. Think about that. Samuel had never even heard of David. The only people that even knew David were a few people in Bethlehem. Think about that. Now, his name is known throughout the world today. Uh, But there was at that particular time when God told Samuel to quit mourning over Saul and get out here and anoint the next king. Samuel still didn't know who he was going to see for sure. One of Jesse's sons he figured out. And they didn't even bring David to the anointing at first. You know the story. Samuel had never heard of David, the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, until that day. (laughs) And then, God says, quit your mourning over Saul. Go out here and anoint this next guy. And he's going to be something that you're not even going to believe. It's going to be a relationship that you can't even imagine. But if you're going to sit around here and groan and moan and gripe and complain and have a pity party and mourn over soul, that's irretrievable, it's irreversible, then you're not going to be able to enjoy what else is going on, getting ready to happen. Now, is there a lot to mourn in this world? You better believe it. Is there a lot to grieve over? You better believe it. And I know it is important to engage the grieving process. And, and I, 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 you know, it can be, we can be talking about uh, deaths or we can be talking about people who are still alive. But at some point, at some point, we have to hear God say, saying, how long are you going to grieve over the past? I have great plans for your future. Good plans. Get up! Step into the future. It's unknown. It's unclear, of course. Samuel had no idea who he was getting ready to anoint. Some little punk teenage kid who ended up being the greatest king Israel ever had. The Bible tells us that nobody, once David got up and running good, nobody messed with him. And God blessed him in so many ways. You know, at some point, we have to look at the goodness of God. Is God good? Yes, He is. We look at the goodness of God and we assume, we just have to assume that there is something good ahead. As a matter of fact, something mighty good. More good than what we could even imagine. 
Dana and I watched a movie last night. It was entitled Heavens to Betsy. If you've never seen it, it's 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 good. It was about this girl who prayed and prayed and prayed for all sorts of things in her life and basically God didn't answer her prayers the way that she wanted them. So she finally got mad at God, even went inside a church building, her church, and she just kind of hollered at God. And when she walked out of the church, the clouds were moving in the sky, you know. Everything changed around, and then all of a sudden her prayers were answered. Every prayer she'd ever prayed had been answered. She ended up being married to this guy that she had a crush on in the eighth grade that was a, a, a heathen. Now this girl was a saved girl heathen and all sorts of stuff and it, it was it was really very well done but it, it, it reminded me again of a lot of times we get mad at God over things when God knows exactly what's best and we don't and we get all mad up at God and bowed up at God and let me tell you something that's not what God wants you to do God says how long are you going to mourn How long are you going to grieve over something that's irreversible and irretrievable? How long are you going to do it? He said, there's something good for you out there. I got the next king for you to know him. And buddy, he's a good one. Nobody's ever heard of him except me. That's what God's telling Samuel. Nobody's ever heard of him except me. But I know he's a man after my own heart. He's going to be something. Don't be paralyzed. Time to move on. Be useful. And be there for those somebodies that God has put and will put into your life. Be there. Let's pray. Well, you may or may not ever heard a message quite like that. But I hope that it's understood and understood in the right way. Father, I thank you for your word today. And I am just so thankful for the truth of it. It's so powerful. <coughs> These stories that we just kind of read through and forget about are just so powerful. have so much for us to glean, to learn. Lord, there's um, things in our life that we may be grieving over and mourning over that we need to get over. And there may be some things we're grieving and mourning that it's not quite time yet. Lord, just whisper in our hearts and in our minds and in our ears. Remind us again today that you've got something good for us. In the days ahead, our life is not over. Oh, certain situations may be over, but our life is not over. We can still be used to bring glory and honor to you and to be a blessing to somebody. And maybe a bunch of somebodies. There's someone here today that needs to know Christ. I pray they'll come. In Jesus' name.